Good morning, church. It is cold and a little bit icy over here, and you guys may have had some ice over there, too. I hope that everyone is well and that everyone is safe. Uh, it is Sunday. We are talking about Jesus and the Gospel of Mark going through um, this annual journey through the life of Jesus that we take as a congregation. Uh, this week represents a turning point in that journey. We've been talking about Jesus' early ministry kind of easing into the sorts of themes and things that he's been doing in the Gospel of Mark. Um, today is what has historically been called Transfiguration Sunday. We're going to talk some about the Transfiguration, but also about the broader context that the Transfiguration of Jesus falls into the way that it fits in the story. And that's important because Transfiguration Sunday, at least this year, falls um, on a rather busy week as far as the Christian calendar goes. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. This coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and we'll talk about that here in a minute too because that's important. And of course, Ash Wednesday begins the season of Lent. And Lent is uh, not the stuff that you pull out of your dryer in this case. Lent is the season that leads up to Easter. This is a season where in the story we are telling about Jesus' life as we go through the Gospels, it is um, a story of increasing conflict, of increasing tension as Jesus heads towards Jerusalem, as he heads towards Passover, as he heads towards Golgotha. Um, and Lent is the season that culminates in the Holy Week with his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, with the Last Supper, with his death, and then that uh, Saturday in the grave of waiting as it dawns on the next season, which is Easter. And so we kind of want to prepare ourselves for all of that. And Transfiguration Sunday, Ash Wednesday, concurring together, they kind of give us a framework for thinking about that. Uh, but before we get any further, let's go ahead and let's read a text this morning. It's in Mark chapter 9. We're skipping ahead a little, which does not mean necessarily that we won't skip back and catch some of the other material as we go, because Mark is full of good stuff. But uh, this is starting in verse 2 of Mark chapter 9. Uh, six days later, and we'll talk about what happened in the days before that in a moment, but six days later, Jesus took Peter and James and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. And he transformed, or your translation may say he transfigured or was transfigured in front of them. And his clothes were amazingly bright and brighter than if they had been bleached white. And Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus and Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we're here. Let us make three shrines, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And he said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them and a voice spoke from the cloud. This is my son whom I dearly love. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one had risen from the dead. And so they kept it, to themselves, kept it to themselves, wondering, what's this rising from the dead? When they asked Jesus, uh, why do the legal experts say that Elijah must come first? He answered, Elijah does come first to restore all things. Why was it written that the human one would suffer many things and be rejected? In fact, I tell you that Elijah has come. But they did to him whatever they wanted, just as it was written about him. And so we have here this strange story about Jesus being transformed up on this high mountain with James and John and Peter. And uh, oftentimes we don't talk a lot about it because we don't quite know what to make of it. And I'm going to just go ahead and confess up front this morning that it is a complex text. And uh, I don't know what all we should make of it. There are depths that we have uh, are inevitably going to leave unexplored this morning, but I want to kind of get some basics going on. Uh, the text starts by saying six days later, and whenever a text says six days later, or then, or after that, or something of that nature, one of the best things we can do is actually back up and get a little context and find out what happened six days before. And what we find is that six days before, the, the episode in the Gospel of Mark immediately preceding this, um, generally speaking, was when Jesus was with the disciples and he said, who do people say that I am? 
And uh, they gave various options. And Jesus says, okay, okay, that's what they're saying. But who do you say that I am? And Peter, in that great moment of clarity, right, this is kind of a highlight of Peter's life. He says, you are, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. You are the one that we've been looking for. You are the one that has been promised throughout all of the Old Testament. The prophets dreamed of you. You're the one. And Jesus affirms that um, confession that Peter makes in grand terms. But then, right after that, what happens in the story is that Jesus begins to define for them what it means for him to be the Messiah. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm sure that they noticed up to this point, that, that as they've been trying to figure out up to this point whether or not Jesus is the Messiah, whether or not he's the one they've been looking for, that there are certain things that make it obvious that he is, but there are also certain things that kind of seem weird for a Messiah to be doing. And so in the obvious boat, you know, he cast out demons. He performs miracles. He had just recently uh, fed the second crowd uh, with very little food in a very miraculous way. He's doing all sorts of things, calming storms. He has the power that they would expect of the Messiah. He's able to do uh, amazing sorts of things, but he seems to use this power in weird ways. Um, they popularly expected, at least many did the Messiah in their day, to come and to um, defeat the Romans, to expel them from the land, to restore Israel. And Jesus rather goes around talking about loving people. He goes around healing people. He doesn't seem to get too worked up in any sort of um, nationalistic or violent way about the Romans. And so at this point, they had to be scratching their head. We believe he's the Messiah, but what sort of Messiah is he going to be? We believe he is the Son of God, but why isn't he acting like the Son of God? And so Jesus, in Mark chapter 8, he begins to define what it means a little more concretely for him to be the Messiah. Uh, against their view that the Messiah would come and use his power to kill the bad guys, uh, Jesus reveals just after Peter's confession that uh, the Son of Man, the Messiah, is actually going to be killed by the bad guys. And of course, this is one of the low moments of Peter's life, right? This is one of those moments where um, he pulls Jesus aside and he says, that's never going to happen. I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe he thought Jesus was too powerful for that to happen. It's just unthinkable that someone with all of the power that Jesus has could, um, could fall to that fate. Or perhaps he knew that the disciples or believed that the disciples would stand up and would defend him. We would never let that happen to you. But whatever at the end of the day, Mark chapter 8, God forbid this should ever happen to you. And Jesus turns to him and he says, get behind me, Satan. So Peter, you know, the great high of the confession, the great low of being called <coughs> Satan by the Son of God in uh, the same episode. But Jesus says, you're going to um, lose me. I'm going to die at the hands of the Romans and the scribes and the Pharisees and Sadducees. And just after that, he enters into a discussion where if you want to, to um, follow me, if you want to be my disciple, then you also must take up your cross. And that cross in the ancient world was a very clear symbol of death, of suffering, of torture. They didn't have them as tattoos or necklaces or other kinds of jewelry. They didn't have them hanging in their houses or as part of the architecture in their day like we do ours. It was a implement of death and so Jesus you must take up your cross and follow me and so Jesus is trying to prepare them for uh, what sort of Messiah he is and how he will proceed as the Messiah how he will be the king how he will institute or instigate or um, bring to bear his rule and then we come to chapter 9 and they go up on this mountain and Jesus is transformed Frustratingly, Mark is short on details. He says his clothes glow white, but Jesus is transformed. I would be more interested in what Jesus looked like than I would be in um, what his clothes looked like. But the three disciples that went up on the mountain with him, that says they were terrified. 
They didn't know what to make of it. And Jesus is being transformed. And all of a sudden there's Elijah and there's Moses. And Jesus is talking with Elijah and Moses. And not knowing how to respond, Peter says, Lord, this is a good thing. Uh, you know, Peter's always the one to kind of jump in there. This is a good thing. Let us build a tabernacle, kind of a place to, to commemorate the moment, to mark the spot, to honor what is going on here. Three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And it says that he did this because he was scared and he didn't know what to say. So he's just trying to, trying to make sense of what is going on. And a cloud overshadows the sun, the text says, and a voice comes from heaven. This is my beloved son. We hear echoes of Jesus' baptism, and you remember we talked about his baptism further back in the story. His baptism was that point where he was marked out as the Messiah. He was marked out as the one that God had sent to kind of set things right, to institute the kingdom. He was marked out as the one that the prophets had been dreaming of and looking for. This is my beloved son, the cloud said then, in whom I am well pleased. Here the cloud says, my beloved son... And in the company of Moses, who was the father of the law, Elijah, who is kind of the prophet of the prophets, Moses was a prophet too, the law and the prophets, God says, hear my son. Jesus is the new paradigm moving forward. And we want to be quick to add, he's the new paradigm moving forward, the new way moving forward, not to say that the old way is bad, but the old way had always pointed to this new way. The old way had always anticipated this new way. The prophets had dreamed of the Messiah. The law led to the Messiah. The poets wrote about the Messiah. Jesus was the fulfillment of all of that. So he says, hear them, or hear him, rather. You want to get that right. Um... And then, look, and Moses and Elijah are gone. They're just Jesus. And they start to head back down the mountain. And Jesus tells them not to say anything about what is going on until after he has been raised from the dead. And it says something very interesting there that kind of gives us a clue as to what is going on here. Um, it says then that they didn't say anything but they wondered, they questioned, what does he mean by being raised from the dead? And so there are a couple of things going on here that we, we kind of want to pay attention to and uh, make some suggestions about what is going on as we prepare ourselves to walk through this part of Jesus' life with him as those who belong to Jesus. Um, first off, we want to mention, I should have mentioned a minute ago, but we'll mention it now. Uh, Jesus' announcement or the, the clouds, the voice from heaven announcing that Jesus is the Son of God. That is, once again, we talked about this in the baptism, that is royal language in the Gospel of Mark. Later, we would get around to talking about Jesus being the Son of God, as in literally the Son of God. But in a Jewish culture in the first century world, um, to say that Jesus is the Son of God is to say that Jesus is the King. And so just as his baptism ties into his identity as the king, his transfiguration ties into his identity as the king. And just on the hills of his announcing his death to the disciples, now this strange event happens in which he says, don't tell anybody about it until I am raised from the dead. And they say, what do you mean by being raised from the dead? And I want to suggest that the transfiguration is also about this kind of identity as the Messiah, what sort of Messiah Jesus is going to be. He has explained to them in the previous chapter that he has to die. This is what it means to be the Messiah. He's not going to kill the bad guys. The bad guys are actually going to kill him. But in chapter 9, God will vindicate him. God has vindicated him, by the way, in uh, announcing his preference for Jesus over the law and the prophets. This is the one that I have chosen. Uh, the kind of subtext there is, this is the one I have chosen. I will not abandon him. Um, I will not just let him go. I will not let his work just kind of go to the wayside or, or be for nothing. God is in this. God is behind this. God is working here. And so there's this moment of faith that we can, we can take from this. Okay, God has Jesus' back, so we should be good here. But in bringing in the resurrection to it, uh, on the hills of chapter 8, I'm going to be 
get killed by the bad guys. We, we see a glimpse. We get the first hint at, mysteriously in the shadows, the first glimpse at God's vindication of Jesus. The dark powers of our world will align on Good Friday, that hill outside the city, to kill the Son of God. But death cannot hold the Son of God. Death is not big enough for the Son of God. And in his transfiguration, N.T. Wright would teach us that most likely what is going on there is Jesus is giving us a forward glimpse, a, a kind of uh, preview, a foretaste of what that resurrection body will be like. You have seen here in a moment what it looks like to be vindicated by God in death. And of course that's important because John says in 1 John chapter 3, he says, we don't know what we will be like then, but we know that we will be like him. Paul, he uh, contributes an entire chapter of 1 Corinthians to the resurrection, which he says again and again and again, Jesus was resurrected and because Jesus was resurrected, we will be resurrected. So what we see going on in the transfiguration is not just a thing for Jesus, but is also a glimpse at our future. Also a glimpse at at what we are headed toward. This is a text of hope. And we need that hope because we're headed into the season of Lent. We're headed into uh, Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is where Christians historically remember that they will die. It's a fact that we like to push away so many times in our world, but we remember that we will die. From dust we have come and to dust we will return. And as those who are subject to death in a world that is controlled by death at present in so many ways, the season of Lent is a season of repentance. As Jesus heads toward the cross to take on the sins of the world, to take on the darkness of the world, we are to contemplate through the season of Lent how we are a part of that darkness of the world. We are a part of that sin that has overtaken the world. And in those moments, it can seem hopeless. That must have been what Peter felt in Mark chapter 8. Um, surely you will not die. God would never let you die. Transfiguration stands against that hopelessness as a beacon of hope. Jesus gives a foretaste. Don't talk about it until the resurrection. It's the resurrection. It's almost like um, Mark 8 is the story, the episode, the movie that we're watching, and assume it's a Marvel movie. Most of you have seen a Marvel movie, surely at least one Marvel movie, and you get to the end of the credits and there's a stinger. There's more to come. The transfiguration is the stinger, the hint, the allegation, the insinuation of more after Jesus' death. God is in this. He will not let it go. And so I want you to grasp, I want you to hold on to the entire story as we go through Ash Wednesday, as we, we go through... Um, the season of Lent as we head toward Easter as we feel the hopelessness of the brokenness of our world God is even now injecting in the midst of that darkness hope into the story and we're going to stop there and I'm going to pray for you and uh, then I'm going to ask you to pray with me and then you guys remember who you are in your home as you get ready to go back out into God's world and be safe and be careful this week it's supposed to be messy uh, and we love you and we can't wait to see you again. But let's pray, and then I'll let you go. Father, help us to hold on to the hope that we have in Jesus. Grant us the courage to be a people of the cross grounded in the hope of the resurrection. May those events in our history and our story be clear in every part of our lives. And we come and we pray now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Church, we'll catch you later. Have a good week.